Mikhail, hi. Good to have you with us. How have you been? I've been good. Thank you so much for having me on board. Mikhail, you know this is this is a session that uh, you know I was looking forward to, right? I'm usually excited about my sessions, but this was a session uh, which is, of course, I'm excited. But uh, you know, I believe is 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 uh, happening at a very important time, and it, it's a very uh, it's a session which is going to be very relevant for a lot of players out there, right? Uh, who have captive audience bases. you know uh, and are looking at a possibility to cater them in some form or the other right and engagement has become so much more important while you are a fintech company you are a fintech infrastructure company uh, i think what you possibly have to offer is improve engagement right uh, visibly a lot of players uh, that are out there in the market right uh, no but i think i think most importantly what we've seen in 2020 i think you know this entire disruption that we've seen right the the, the transition into being a tech driven economy that we've seen right uh, for a market as large as india we couldn't have and we wouldn't have been able to do it you know one of course if there was no connectivity but more importantly if there was no or a lesser of the fintech ecosystem uh that possibly came together in the in the in 2017 onwards right uh, uh had that not been there i think we would have been in a in a in a, in a crazy zone right uh, and i think all of this is now kind of also improving because there are certain habits and tendencies that are set in right uh, we as consumers have become uh, so much more mature uh, our comfort in transacting online has, has come in right and that essentially means that businesses will have to look at financing as an angle right somebody classically said uh, if i'm not wrong i think it was somebody from apple right that eventually every company will be a fintech company right and i think i think that's a, that's a narrative which is coming through for india for sure uh, in many ways uh thus right and you are empowering a lot of these these organizations to go fintech right uh, to offer that that additional layer uh, of engagement right uh, of interacting also in a in a very strong way helping them retain their clients and customers right uh it just become so much more important uh right in that sense with that mikhail it's a pleasure to have you with us uh, you know before i uh, dive into our session today of talking about apollo and mess and some of the very interesting choices that you've made right which you got to talk about through the course of this conversation i'd love you to run us through your background uh and, and yeah i think that'll be a perfect start to this conversation over to you thank you firstly uh, for the warm welcome and you know um pleasure to be here a little bit about me is you know roughly have been building internet companies in india for about a decade or so now right i completed my graduation it seems like a lifetime ago uh from carnegie mellon university in 2011 and really post then right i've been building uh you know uh, in the digital world and and been blessed in many ways right i started off by being one of the very very early team members at at a company called coupon dunia Uh-huh. Like I was uh, the fourth employee there, and I headed, uh, you know, product back then. <laughs> that company got acquired by Times Internet. Uh, post that, I went on to, you know, co-found uh, Farm Easy, uh, right. which was a phenomenal journey. Uh, we <laughs> ended up building, uh, it seems, the largest, uh, you know, healthcare platform in India today. Right. Uh, post that, uh, you know, went on to basically head, you know, products and growth at at Hotstar. Right. and uh, you know that was a roller coaster journey as well right like i remember when i joined the company uh, day one you know on the dashboard i saw that we had about 7 million monthly active users and right. coming from you know early stage startup that felt like a humongous number back then <laughs> right? right and you know when i ended my stint over there once we got acquired by disney that number was 350 million monthly active users wow. right and wow. uh, yeah it just that was just mind boggling right like um, you know to be part of that experience just from a pure actually technology perspective to have like 60% yeah. of smartphones in india have the hotstar app installed that's that's a surreal feeling right right and and then of course you know now i have uh, you know the pleasure to basically be the md and ceo at apollo invest right uh, we are a public listed nbfc and you know like you eloquently put it in one simple line we essentially enable you know any company to start offering uh, you know digital loans to their audience in a matter of 48 hours interesting so that's uh, that's been the journey so far you know before i start talking to you about a pole of invest right uh, i think what's interesting to i think which is a constant i think pretty much across your journey right a lot of you know growth and a lot of acquisitions right you possibly a lucky charm for many out there right uh, i think and and and, and founders should be reaching out to you separately right <laughs> interesting nikhil uh apollo invest right uh, now from a lot of what you did right which is which which essentially is is in the consumer internet space right you when you got into literally an nbfc ecosystem right uh, and and within the nbfc ecosystem you kind of got into the infrastructure layer right now that's not the sexy side of the business right and the sexy side of the business is creating a fun front ending product you know and we have many players uh, in that space right uh, now that's 
you know, in a in a market which is say flooded with capital, there's just so much more excitement, right? Uh, there are very few players when it comes to infrastructure, infrastructure, right? Uh, and I can actually count uh, these these players, right? Uh, that must have been a difficult choice, right? Uh, uh, I mean, you know, with all the money flowing in, all the glamour, all the excitement, um, also, you know, uh, the scope of building newer products, right? Why did you choose to be uh, uh, you know, taking taking a step back and then you know being that layer which enables all these guys or all of these players to go out and build on top of right uh, would have been difficult. Uh, but love to understand the, the thesis behind behind doing that. But also, uh, you know, means is we're talking about the larger market, right? In terms of how you dissect it, would love to understand how did you prioritize it and why did you prioritize. It? Well, that's a great question, right? And and it's uh, you know uh, something which you know if I look at you know, how the stars kind of align, I mean, um, you know, I would have it no other way, right? So essentially, like, this starts back in, you know, when I was in Farm Easy, right? Like, and, right. you know, we had, you know, uh, we had, like, the best investors on our cap table, you know, all flooded with kind of equity capital in hundreds of millions of dollars, right? And and I right. remember back then as well, the biggest problem that we had towards our growth was the fact that, you know, the pharma retailers were working with us, right? The mom and pop retailers. They were all struggling for working capital, right? And, right? and these were people who were making anywhere between 30, 40 lakh rupees a year of profit, right? And this was like four or five X, the normal mom and pop retailer, right? So they were really profitable right. businesses, right? Uh, and, you know, to me back then, it was obvious that, you know, somebody would give them like 10, 20 lakh rupees of working capital, right? Some bank would come in and it's a no brainer kind of opportunity, right? But they struggled, right? Nobody mm-hmm. would even sanction them limits of, you know, higher than three, four lakh rupees because right. they would essentially discount the entire online business that they were doing. They would just call that as unstable, right? Mm-hmm. Because for them, they were the outliers in the ecosystem and their revenues didn't, you know, uh, didn't basically represent the normal right. course of operations. Right. Uh, and that became such a huge problem at Farm Easy. I remember like these two actually go to our friends and family and try and arrange loans. And it's incredibly, uh, it's a very, you know, weird sell because imagine mm-hmm. in a newspaper, if it's coming that, you know, your company has raised like $200 million, right. right. And you're asking somebody for a 10, 20 <laughs> lakh rupee loan, you know, they think it's a scam. Right. Right. <laughs> so basic, something is wrong somewhere. Exactly. Right. I mean, the question we used to get is like, guys, you have like, th- you're supposed to be having thousand crores in your bank account, but you want me to give you 20 lakh rupees. Like, <laughs> so that was just very off putting. Right. And, and, you know, that was my first, uh, basically, uh, you know, brush with, you know, what's basically happening in the financial world today, right? right. You know, follow that up with Hotstar, right? And and that was just eye-opening, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know, it's no secret, right? Like, when you have a business like Hotstar, uh, you know, at that point in time, like, 95% of the revenue used to come from ads, right? Mm-hmm. And that's not a space that, you know, uh, we wanted to basically continue existing sure. in. We wanted to build a very, very strong subscription business, right? Mm-hmm. And we did like a lot of demographic analysis since we had majority of India on our platform. Right. And, you know, it hit me like a, you know, a, you know, brick wall basically at that point in time where like 90% of India didn't have access to formal credit, right? right? So, you know, that immediately kind of majority ruled them out of our subscription model right. because if they don't have any access to formal credit, how are they even supposed to subscribe to my platform, right? right? And then this problem just became like, uh, you know, it was a moment of inception to me because right. I just felt like fundamentally, this is a massive opportunity, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, somebody needs to solve for this, right? And that's when right. I actually started to my, started talking to my, you know, now co-founder, uh, Diksha, that, you know, she was in HDFC at that point in time. And, you know, I just basically continuously kind of start chewing on her ear that, you know, mm-hmm. this is such a massive opportunity. Why isn't right. anybody kind of actively solving for this? Right. And, right. and our answers were really, really clear to me that fundamentally, like it's a great opportunity, but the reality is the infrastructure or the, you know, the, the cost of doing those transactions, right. For a five, 10,000, 20,000 rupee loan, they just don't make unit economic sense in right. one simple line, you know, for traditional lenders. So they just don't bother with it. And mm-hmm. what they're serving today is the hundred million or customers, and that's a very profitable segment, right? So there is right. no incentive for you to kind of chase the remaining billion people in the country, right? right. And this was just, uh, you know, this was something which honestly just kept me up at night, right? Like where, uh, you know, how do we solve this problem, right? And then, right. you know, uh, there was this division point, right? Right. Uh, there are two ways in which I could potentially attack this problem. 
right? right? One way would be like, you know, to build a lending company, mm-hmm. which would be like a traditional fintech, right? Which is basically like you build an app or a website or something like that. You basically become right. a company which is offering loans, right? Of some right. sort. Um, the other way would be, you know, to think what if we could create a platform which could, you know, sprout a hundred of these fintechs essentially, right? right? Um, and then basically, you know, there was two things which really, really motivated me to build the infrastructure, right? Mm-hmm. One was basically as in when, you know, as I had built Hotstar, right? I realized basically there are many, many companies like Hotstar already today, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, your Flipkart, Uber, Zola, Zomatos, right? Which already had millions of users on the platform. So you don't need to kind of reinvent the wheel in terms of distribution, right? right. They're already there. They already know their customers well. They already know their merchants well, right? So they are in actually prime positions to do distribution mm-hmm. of financial services. Right. So that's point one. And mm-hmm. point two was, you know, a very fundamental aspect about building startups, which I hold through to, you know, very dear to myself, is mm-hmm. this concept of, you know, founder market fit, right? right? Uh, whenever you build a company, right? It's not only about seeing a uh, product market fit, right? Because sometimes you'll be able to achieve that if you really, really are good at building products. But there right. is, in the long term, what actually really works well is this concept of founder market fit, right? That you mm-hmm. have to be actually well suited uh, and you have to have that superpower required to build the startup <laughs> that you're building, right. right? So my superpower, right, basically is building really, really scalable technology platforms, right? That's that's who I am, right? Like I'm right. not a banker, um, you know, I don't pretend to be one. So, you know, from that aspect of things, right, all of those things, you know, stars aligning led us right. to basically build now the infrastructure platform of Apollo Invest. Interesting. You know, I, I you know, I, I think you, you kind of very casually say it, right? That listen, I'm not a banker, I'm a technologist, right? And that's the choice that I've made, and I'm I suit for this business, right? But I think you know, and many people are going to be watching this, right? Uh, I think if any of them you know read your newsletter, which comes out, right? I've become an ardent fan. Uh, you know, uh, a banker with creativity and understanding technology. How this is how I'd possibly like to put it, right? Uh, you don't need to have superpowers to be a banker, right? I think I think it's, it's extreme common sense, right? Uh, and a lot of arbitrage in the process. Uh, Miguel, uh, you have alluded to it, right? In terms of your ability, right? Now, when I when I when I when I read about Apollo Fintech, right? Uh, well, very clearly, you know, your website, you uh, you know, very clearly sort of spells this out, right? That you know, we are a tech company with an NBFC license, right? Now, what I would love to understand is the construct of it before I jump out of the unit economics of it, right? Because the choice that you made. Uh, is a very different kind of a choice, right? Uh, I'd love to understand the unit comes model, but before that, I'd love to understand this this entire, uh, you know, the framework that you've built of uh, being a tech company with an NBFC license, right? What's the thought behind that? So I think, you know, the way we look at it, right, is ultimately, you know, uh, like I alluded to before, right, there are so many companies out there with this massive distribution and sure. you know, customer base, right? So let's take an example right now. Sure. Um, you know, one of the common examples that we give is, you know, one of Sumato, right? Being the public right. listed, uh, you know, uh, favorite child that people want to talk about is <laughs> is basically like, imagine they have so many restaurants on the platform, they control the supply to these restaurants, basically in terms right. of, you know, demand coming from customers. Right. You know, they know these restaurants really, really well, right? Like, and, uh, you know, in many ways, the destiny of Zomato lies in the growth of these restaurants, right? Because right. one can't go uh, without the other in many ways, Absolutely. right? And now... Right if restaurants are not getting funding from traditional means, it is the prerogative of Zomato to make sure they get funded. Otherwise they can't scale. And, you know, quality supply uh, is only the one which is actually going to seek demand in a market like this, right? You want a Domino's pizza. You don't necessarily want a random pizza, basically. (laughs) So a lot of these companies, right, are in the same position. When you think about a Flipkart, Amazon, you know, so many of these players, right, Nishos, all of these guys are in the same boat. Right. Now, when you think about this kind of opportunity, you combine right. that with what is basically happening in India today from an, uh, you know, from a regulator perspective, right? Sure. We have, you know, like uh, from a technology perspective, what this country has done is stunning, right? right. We have UPI, we are now building EKYC. We have actually made a process by which we can actually do end-to-end digital lending, right? Like now technology right. is going where roads couldn't go before. You know, sure. thanks to obviously, you know, you add geo into the mix. You have, uh, <laughs> right. you know, you have, I think what's going to basically be happening over the next mm-hmm. decade or so is going to be the most, uh, it's going to be a case study basically sure. in 2035 you know, as to how in 10 years a country basically went from having 10% financial inclusion to probably 70, 75% financial inclusion. Right. right. And to me, that is electrifying. Right. Like it's literally like, you know, 
switching on electricity for entire india because what right. happens right with credit and to me this is the most you know intimate aspect of credit right once you provide a person with credit you know you're giving them an opportunity to grow basically right, right? it's literally what it means is basically right. you're giving credit to somebody or giving them an opportunity to become a best version or bigger version of themselves and imagine when you start doing this at scale you know right. what that results in from a country perspective what that results in from an improvement in gdp perspective is astounding right interesting so, right so that's that's something which constantly keeps Super. inspiring us Super. you know michael a lot of very interesting points right uh, i you know i have the love of macroeconomics right and i completely agree with what you're saying right i think i think uh, you know if you can empower people with you know circulation of capital if not capital right i think that can you know the kind of impact that can it can have is 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 far more uh, you know it's phenomenal right and very very serious at many levels right but mikhil before before we we sort of get into that side of discussion and i have a bunch of questions on that side right especially in the 2020 context, context right so uh, but before i do that what i would love to understand right is you kind of give an example of zomato right uh, now you're not limiting yourself to zomato you're actually going beyond that right you're empowering uh, organizations across multiple layers right uh, them their clients right uh, to cater to their customers better right so basically you're helping them you know basically create a, a you know a circuit of sorts uh, which is uh, you know and and making credit available right uh, in a very systematic format which just helps them which brings in a lot of smoothness right it basically lubricates their entire say operational strategy and all of that right it reduces friction uh, which otherwise is very very high in a b2b ecosystem right because there are there are there are trade cycles uh, you know and the money is constantly stuck right i was looking at a number which are institutional delinquency which is not part of civil is is upwards of 3 lakh crores in in india market my sense is this number is three times bigger than that right so uh, what you're doing is you are actually taking a lot of that friction away right by 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 sort of helping organizations build these kind of structures right uh so by by very fundamental question this right that these are not organizations that are financially savvy i mean they're very good at cash flow management they are very good at productizing it right but when we talk of financing right in general we're talking about underwriting we are talking about understanding the risk uh how does that happen these are organizations that were never calibrated for it right they don't have the required resources to do that right now when you say we are a tech plus an nbfc right now is that a play that you help them build or in a way you absorb that piece 100% saying that listen we understand your business we understand the relationship that you have with your clients and customers we'll help you do this better right you know cost extra that you have to sort of say put together or you tell them that this is infrastructure which is available you'll have to build your own models because this is a risk that you understand right which is that which is which is the the piece at, that you or which is line of action that you take and and help them solve it i'd love to understand that this is a great question right sure. so the way we think about this basically right is absolutely fundamentally clear right mm-hmm. if you are a tech company again you should not mistake yourself to be sure. a lending company right? right there should be a very clear divide right like sure. don't mistake yourself to be an hdfc or an icici who has you know thousands of people basically doing right. offline collections for them in short right. right and or having a massive call center um the way all these companies need to smartly think essentially and this is what actually the best companies do right they productize lending right mm-hmm. now i'll give you an example of this right to be very very clear right so right. let's take the example of zomato to continue the story sure. right now zomato probably has you know 10000 20000 odd restaurants right it's, it's right. working with or even more right sure. the goal for them right and and this is how basically all marketplaces kind of work right is that 80% of the orders actually come from 20% of the merchants right? right so the goal that they basically have right in order to you know increase their business is to just finance their top 20% restaurants right right it's not to go after the mass market right because the minute you know we get a fintech who starts talking about like listen we have so many people on our platform and we want to finance all of them we tell right. them that you know that's a recipe for disaster right, right? what you are actually supposed to be doing is number one focus on the key needle movers right interesting if you finance your top 10% you are basically financing the you know probably 50% of your volume coming on your right. entire platform and you can grow that to be double or triple right so mm-hmm. that's point one point right. two by default when you do this right what actually ends up happening is because you are lending to your best customers the risk goes down significantly right sure and number 3 the most important aspect of lending is basically don't depend on collections right because right. the minute you start thinking that i'm going to be start collecting the money in any format 
traditionally that's going to be a disaster experience sure. what you're supposed to be actually be doing is build tech into it so i'll give you an example mm-hmm. right what happens sure. with a lot of companies like zomato is that when they enable this lending essentially mm-hmm. right for a restaurant every right. day as in when they or- get orders from customers right the money which is flowing through customers zomato takes the emi out of that right on an everyday right. basis and passes on the balance to the restaurant right so there is no dependency on the merchant to basically pay you back similarly right. the thought process can be applied to zomato amazon flipkart whoever right sure. so if you do lending in this way right really really focused so you know we say this quite a lot right like when it comes to you know platform lenders right if you mm-hmm. start thinking about nims when it comes to lending you are headed in the wrong territory right? because then you will want to do volumes then you will want to basically be driving you know lending to 80% of your customers and that's a recipe for disaster but if you but, kind of focus on sir, going it to the top 20% then the risk arbitrage will be on your side interesting but because you know i mean on one side of it i understand why you've chosen for example the tech environment right uh, because of the predictability because you know you're able to ring fence your you know payments collection there is no cost whatsoever on the collection side of it and you know delinquencies are much lesser right so you have an improved book right and i understand that right but when you are doing that right aren't you choosing a much smaller market right because you know the world at least india uh and when i say the world what i what i essentially mean is is the many many layers that we operate across right and the regions that we operate across right and there are a lot of those you know risks that come in there are a lot of those cultural baggages that are that are built into consumption right uh you consciously choosing to not deal with that business because you know there's possibly lesser predictability these are people who are still at a fringe they're coming online uh what's your sense or are you just waiting for it to sort of you know the transformation to happen at a at a deeper level right for you to sort of start looking at that business are you are you uh, is there a correct understanding or uh, there are plans that you have to cater to see this you know beyond these tech companies right who are catering to certain audience space what's what's the sense there so i would break this up into you know two parts broadly sure. right mm-hmm. one is basically when we go via these companies right in order to uh, provide credit to end customers right and these end customers sure. can be merchants or it can be retail customers right right now within these end customers right when they are retail customers or they are merchants basically we tend to cater to their top merchants or their top customers right interesting now the reason why you do that is basically to make sure you build an a plus book right right so that is one aspect of things right mm-hmm. now the other aspect of things is this whole concept of financial inclusion right right now what is basically happening right and why this approach is actually correct is because by default when you start catering to the people who are doing the maximum number of what does this really mean right when you say that you're catering to the best merchants or the best customers you are basically right. funding the customers who do the maximum amount of digital transactions sure right so that's what gives the predictability that's what gives you the data right now the ultimate reality what is actually happening is you know the whole concept of internet penetration in india is growing at an astounding pace right right transactions which were happening pre covid offline are now moving at a tremendous pace online post covid sure. especially right right so basically two things which are working in our benefit right is right. this pie is actually an ever expanding pie you know that's that's number one because right. this pie is ever expanding plus the customer base that we end up funding as it is end up ends up doing 80% of the transactions out of 100% right right so you end up serving the best majority right instead of mm-hmm. basically trying to go after the 20% minority right which may be doing least number of transactions and right. their overall contribution to the marketplace itself may not be worth the risk to in order to serve them right but mm-hmm. that doesn't mean they don't get into the top you know 20% in some point in time because usually the cycle that we've observed right both with customers and with merchants is that right. probably in about 12 to 24 months time they start creeping into the bottom percentage of the top 20% right interesting that's that's how the pie keeps expanding super uh nikhil uh you know i mean i i, I think you know any conversation today uh, where you not talk of covid i think it's going to be incomplete right and i think in your case it just becomes so much more important right uh 2020 has been unreal uh, uh you know like you like you kind of mentioned right uh, that we haven't seen the kind of transition that we have like you know in the last two years right uh there was a lot of infrastructure that existed we leveraged that infrastructure right uh i am i i you know i would like to understand a slightly different aspect of of this transition which is happening right uh now my my fundamental belief is that 
you know content is going to play has played a very significant role in the last two years content going forward is going to play a very very critical role right what i'm alluding to is influence right earlier influence used to be fragmented right so there was a lot of influence that you would get from our friends family it was like a it was not a consistent ecosystem right it was it was in a way a tangential ecosystem right you would hear something from somebody there was a physical uh, you know element to that you would consume online but not necessarily spending as much time right cut to today right we're spending a lot more time right uh, the kids at home are watching uh, you know they're consuming pretty much education online uh, you know we are taking a lot of decisions online right so it is a fundamental shift that has happened in the economy right and and that fundamental shift is that you know as soon as we hear of something we want to read about it we want to understand something about it and then we want to get into a transactional cycle but it, what it's also doing is that it's bringing in this you know this 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 craziness in the market right our the arbitrage that used to exist right uh, between markets is kind of going away uh when you talk of food business for example ramens has seen a crazy growth in 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 you know last two years right uh, you know that necessarily they weren't they not used to be the case right so where where i'm coming from is and what i'm kind of getting to is that we are headed into a uh, uh you know into into being a land which is not necessarily going to be very predictable right uh, the nature of engagement is going to be uh is going to be fringe right it's going to be there's going to be a lot of uh you know touch and go that that is going to happen with businesses right businesses will have to be far more agile now when you say talk of somato right and when you say that listen i am cutting it for the 20% or the 30% who are doing say 50% or 60% of the business on the platform right going forward these are businesses that might not necessarily have similar traction right uh, these are businesses that could be in a very different shape that that uh, the kind of volumes that they're doing could really uh take a beat right now that's my sense of it when i look at d2c right uh, again a similar play is uh, you know uh, you know i see a similar play right that businesses are going to have lesser of predictability in what the consumer wants right founders are going to find it difficult to understand trends because by the time they are they, they get into an opportunity or they get into an understanding of a trend the trend would possibly start to look different right the stability in the in the revenues right will start to look different right which essentially means for lending companies it's only a very very difficult ecosystem i am worried about how tier 2 and tier 3 is going to react because on the consumer side the aspiration is going to literally match that of a tier one city and global aspiration right i am worried about the supply chain right uh, which is going to fulfill these requirements what's your sense of it uh, how do you see it how are you preparing yourself i can put it that way uh, for the change that you know we are experiencing but are very very early trends uh, this is something which is going to become thicker as we as we go along but how are you visualizing this right because there are going to be no clear leaders right even a zomato for that matter will have to engage now you know pretty much the entire set of people uh, uh might not necessarily be able to depend themselves on the, the top 20% uh, or the top the 30% right uh, uh, from a relationship standpoint right uh, what's your sense of it how are you seeing it does that changes the rules of the game for you how you've cut it how you prepared yourself uh how do you visualize india of in the next couple of years well it's a great question right i think you know this is something which you know you know as being the kind of you know the positioning that we have in the market right as being this infrastructure player honestly we have like a god view of the market in many sure. ways right because <laughs> you know we work with uh, so many fintechs right and and very honestly what ends up happening right is when it whenever it comes to downtrends or uptrends you know sometimes certain companies are very resistant to uh, either one of them right sure sometimes a company when it comes to an uptrend may not see that uptrend and sometimes a company when it comes to a downtrend may be able to withstand uh, you know the sure. the headwinds as well right but what happens for us is that overall from a market perspective we are able to identify this and accordingly we you know decide the next steps on a macro level right right because fundamentally what we at least come to it right is that you may be the best founder in the world but it's sure. very very difficult to beat the market Right. right at least that's the stance that we have as as being basically uh, you know this infrastructure company right where we have to take a view on the market right. right so definitely from that perspective right we do help the fintechs that we end up working with by giving them this kind of insight right because as an example right. you know zomato may have a certain kind of insight from restaurants but you know right. maybe we are getting another kind of insight by working with another food aggregator right right uh even within this space right what ends up happening is there is a lot of slicing and dicing right, right. because maybe fast food chains are seeing this kind of you know x amount of growth but maybe niche restaurants are seeing y kind of growth 
Correct. Right. So there is a lot of slicing and dicing to be done even within you know these kind of spaces, right? So right. therefore, actually, the way we kind of work, right, is we try and tell all the fintechs that we work with, right, try and have a very very niche, verticalized, focused attempt at fintech, right? Mm-hmm. Don't go with this broad based approach. That, as an example, you know, just go after the market and and attack <laughs> everything, right? Because you right. know one of the most important aspects about building a fintech company, right? And we're an infrastructure right. player, right? But one of the things we hold very dear to ourselves, right, is the quality of the book that you generate, not the quantity, right? right? Because if you're building a lending company, right, or if you're building a financial services company, you have to build one which lasts for fifty years, right? Sure. And you know what's the most important thing when you're building something like this is trust. Trust right. your investors, both from an equity and debt perspective, have on your capability of building a sound business. Right. Interesting. It can't be a business model which, over a period of time, like in a couple of years, you know, there's a there's a blast which happens, right? Because right. in order to recover from that as a financial services company, it's very very difficult because people just don't have the trust on you anymore, right? right. So we encourage our fintechs to do the same thing that you have an extremely narrow, verticalized focus to start with. As right. you start dominating a particular vertical within your marketplace, then you kind of expand, you know, horizontally. But you don't go horizontal very very early on. Interesting, interesting. Here, uh, you know, I, 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 I mentioned this earlier, right? And I actually wanted to talk to you about, you know, on the business model side of things, right? Now, you're empowering many of these organizations to go out and deliver better, right? I think partnerships has been uh, is very critical to, I think, uh, you know, your growth, um, you know, and 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 I think the overall construct of of how Apollo Invest is designed, right? Uh, as an organization, uh, what I would love to understand is that. You know, you've chosen to be an infrastructure company, right? And 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 I think you kind of justified your stance, right? In terms of, uh, you know, the suitability of of the founding team, right? Uh, which is just so much more important. Uh, what happens? Well, what's the business model like, right? Uh, uh, you know, you are also bringing in a lot of intelligence, right? What you alluded to in your earlier point, right? Um, is there a partnership at play uh, where you have uh, long term interests, uh, uh, you know, in the profitability of uh, you know the exposure that these companies take, or there's a different model at play where you know, given that you're an infrastructure company, you're in a B two B environment, right? Uh, you have to be far more efficient, right? Because you know, at the end of the day, the higher you go on your pricing, you know, creates an ability for a lot of these players to, uh, you know, maintain their margins, right? And that's that's unfortunate problem of being a B two B player, right? Uh, where are you on that, and how are you balancing that? Love to understand that. Well. Definitely right. I mean, the way we think about it, right? Like, uh, you know, I think like you said earlier, right? We think about ourselves as a tech company which happens to have an NBFC license, right? So broadly, uh, you know, on a ten thousand feet overview level, right? Like, you know, this kind of reflects in our revenues as well. Like, being a listed company, uh, you know, I can say this that you know, almost sixty percent of our revenue ends up coming from API income, tech income, right? Which right. is pure play basically like people accessing the tech infrastructure that we built using those apis right this is ekyc apis credit bureau apis uh, you know disbursement apis collection apis bank right. statement analysis like there are 20 different kind of these apis which are available which sure. you know uh, fintechs can basically use as lego pieces right to basically right. build the perfect product you know for their end customers so right. that's one aspect of it i think the second aspect of it is kind of uh, one of the most pivotal aspects actually for them Is a loan management system that we built specifically for digital lending, right? Which is Sonic, right? Uh, now that's also a critical piece because none of these fintechs that we work with, right, like end up having like a, uh, you know, end up wanting to obviously build an LMS on their own or at the same point in time, <laughs> right. you know, uh, all the LMSs which pretty much exist today, they are more catering to traditional lenders, right? Which is the branch right. model. So uh-huh. something like this works seamlessly for them. And then the minute these fintechs basically want to scale, obviously they require capital. Right, so this right. is where we have a concept called as capital as a service, where we provide capital at a fixed ROI, you know, for this fintech to basically use for a period of you know year or two years as an example, and this right. basically ensures that you know their you know their supply is sorted, right? They know what to expect from a supply chain management perspective in terms of capital, and right. then they can plan you know their growth aspects accordingly, knowing the cost and knowing the amount of capital that they have, right? um Interesting. and this is actually very very pivotal because even during covid right one of the things which was very very hurtful for a lot of fintechs in the indian ecosystem was the fact that you know the partners basically just pulled the rug under you know their legs right and they had no where to go to right and that's where we actually right. saw phenomenal growth uh, on the partnership side of things because 
suddenly when traditional lenders just shut off their complete you know fintech branches in many ways because it was like 2% or 1% of their business a lot of right. them jumped onto our platform because of the a ease of you know going live on it in a matter of 48 okay. hours plus you know getting those long term capital engagements from them so one of the things that we basically do right is you know and this is like kind of signature on our platform is we don't sure. do short term engagement right and we don't work with fintechs uh, or companies basically who don't have that clear commitment from a uh, you know manpower and capital perspective towards this adventure that they are getting on right as an example when we work with a lot of these platform companies uh, you know which are the kinds of companies like an ola or a zomato or whatever right fintech right. may not be the number one thing for the company at all right this is sure. a this is another vertical but day zero right. as an example you know we make sure that they are committed to this project and we only engage in multi year projects as an example right, right? like if mm-hmm. if somebody approaches us to do like a 3 month 6 oh, no. month pilot that's something we don't you know get into at all right right because for us it's very very important that the opposite person has a clear you know commitment okay. and is happy to give skin in the game otherwise it's going to be a very very poor experience in our you know four years of doing this one of the right. biggest lessons that we've learned is that if the opposite person is not giving enough love and attention to this it's right. bound for failure interesting interesting bahil uh, you know i'd love to talk to you a little about policy right uh, now when we talk about lending uh, uh, you know and, and i think this cannot uh, go and you know not being discussed right uh, now policy is not necessarily you know been very clear right uh, there are a lot of gray areas there are a lot of players who are you know building routes around you know basically supplementing um you know some of those aspects right uh, nothing wrong with that i think that's part of evolution right you you have to sort of make the regulators think better harder right that's that's the school of thought that i come from i think that's the fundamental of i think any startup which is out there uh but for an infrastructure company uh there's a lot of risk right uh, because you know eventually you're working with a lot of these uh fintech clients right uh, you are the support system uh, which is uh, helping them deliver that kind of an experience right uh, you also possibly give them the exposure which is required right uh, there have been instances right in the recent past which are not necessarily very uh, uh, you know happy instances right or the the industry at large right uh, there have been certain players who abused uh, uh, you know their uh, how do i put it right uh, you know uh, abuse their systems right or abuse systems in general to uh, which is not necessarily been very very relevant and right for you know consumers at large uh, that is brought the infrastructure companies under a lot of uh, criticism in certain ways uh, also scrutiny uh, what's your sense of it right i mean how 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 difficult has this been right when you are building one uh, and like i said right when you are a front ending fintech company you know you're in a different zone altogether right here you are supporting them uh what you can possibly do is very limited when it comes to any kind of an act right uh how are you tackling all of what is happening on the policy front how are you looking at it right and what do you believe should be done going forward so that this becomes a far more connected ecosystem with lesser of aberrations and inconsistencies that that possibly exist right what's your thought on that i mean actually i have a very clear thought process on this right like fundamentally right. like uh, you know you asked uh, you know how's the experience been and how's the challenge been honestly it's i don't call this a challenge right i i call this like basically uh, you know privilege to be very honest right, right. because fundamentally like you know uh, ultimately right if you want to build a lending business in india right you know regulations come hand in hand right? and this is not something new for me at least as an example like you know a lot of fintech players may get uh, you know disturbed by these things as an example right. but for me as an example you know i built farmizi right so over there right. you know literally we were selling drugs online in one right. in one simple right. line right like and we had all kinds of activities that you know we had to kind of deal with from a regulatory perspective over there and right. ultimately you know what ends up winning out right like i think you know it's very important as we kind of tackle these you know short term problems it's very important to think from the country and from the regulators perspective and this is how we thought right. about it at farmizi as well right fundamentally you have to ask yourself what does the regulator want and what does the country need right these are right. the two things right sure fundamentally um, you know today as an example what does the regulator really want the regulator sure. basically wants you to basically you know treat your borrowers fairly essentially mm-hmm. right that's their right. ask right sure. everything else is just noise basically mm-hmm. right and what does it mean by treating your you know borrowers fairly right it means just two things number one is when you are charging them 
num have fair pricing don't mm-hmm. basically charge them exorbitant pricing which sure. could be taking advantage of these you know borrowers and third have the right practices when you're doing collections this is right. all there is to it basically sure. right mm-hmm. so these are certain things as an example it's actually a very easy problem to solve by right. doing one of the two things right sure at one point in time i'm pretty sure the regulator is going to come out with a clear definition of what all of these things mean right because right. none of these things by the way are unique right this is like lending is one of the oldest businesses in india and right. these three aspects right have been already it's a solved problem by hdfc by icici by sbi all of these guys they follow right. certain practices the mm-hmm. only reason why today in india there is um, you know so much mystery around them is is there mm-hmm. isn't one by the way like a template or a bible given out by the rbi saying you know this is what you do and possibly sure. i can understand their challenges because every business is maybe you need to tweak these aspects in certain way so everything can't be followed but mm-hmm. what we are doing right as a platform is in absence of clarity over there we are bringing clarity right so we okay. have a robust set of basically policies that we expect our fintechs mandatorily to follow right mm-hmm. if you don't follow these things we are very candid and we are happy to basically not work with people who don't follow mm-hmm. these policies right so as an example simple stuff like you know you don't do short term loans you don't encourage right. basically you know loan sharks right you don't do into like that 7 day 14 day kind of loans you know we have a very clear policy that you have to do 62 days or higher kind of duration kind of loans right you right. don't do loans which are more than 36% interest rate you know again there is no law which says that you can't do it but right. you have to take a stance somewhere where you kind of understand sure. that even from a unit economics perspective even though there may be certain kind of loans which may not make economic sense right as as a formal ecosystem we have to challenge ourselves harder of how mm-hmm. to work within these constraints to deliver the kind of experiences that we want to to end customers right? right even from a collection standpoint right what are the measures you're taking you know so that customers and borrowers are treated like you would want to be treated in the case right. you are borrowed right that's right. the stance that we basically have right and what we are doing and you know this is a little bit of a forward statement sometime you know in the next week or so you will actually see we're actually putting it up on the website for everybody as part of our blog right to make sure the entire eco- fintech ecosystem has a bible of what is some kind of rules and regulations you should follow in right. order to give your borrowers the best experiences and you know for what's the best for the future of fintech in india right so that's an initiative we've taken on and you know sometime this week or you know in the next 7 days or so it should be available for public reading as well and i think i would definitely one go through and recommend it to a lot of people i mean fintech is something which is you know i have enjoyed understanding it learning about it and you know and most importantly the changing ecosystem right and the kind of role that you know fintechs are going to play going forward right uh, uh, so we would we would be more than happy to sort of uh, you know in whatever little way we can contribute we'd be more than happy to sort of contribute miguel moving uh, away from business right of course we can't you to be in the domain of business right uh, but moving away from the operational aspects of uh, of a polyfin invest right you've chosen uh, a very different kind of kind of a path right uh, a polyfin invest is a listed entity uh, what's been the logic behind that right i mean i mean you talk to a founder today you know they want to go out and raise more and more and more capital i mean you know you know you've been at farm you right i mean you know the drill uh, already uh, you've chosen a very different path right what's been the motivation there i'd love to understand that and possibly a bunch of cues for many people who don't necessarily consider that to be a path right i'd love you to spell that out no definitely right i think you know many many aspects went into this decision right, right. i think the first fundamental aspect like which you know some people don't know about apollo right is it's actually like a 30 plus you know year old company mm-hmm. right so this was actually started by my dad he was a first generation entrepreneur he had an ipo back in the 1990s basically right so it's it's that old right and and you know when you we were thinking about you know building you know something in the fintech space um you know i had two options right either go right. the private way or the public way and you know two things really attracted me over here right one is um there was an nbfc in the backyard right, right. and number two you know we had investors you know who are publicly holding our stock for the last 30 years you know waiting to see what happens next right, right? and it was like a sleeping giant interesting right uh, 
in many ways you know we wanted to basically give back to them right and now right. we kind of uh, obviously you know in many ways uh, they've seen a huge wealth multiplier in the last you know four years right. but in many ways it was our duty you know to do that and you know reward them for that patience right uh, so that was the first aspect of it right i think the sec- second aspect of it is you know you know fundamentally i think you know as a second time founder right one of the things which you know i think a lot of people basically understand after doing the business right is right. you know the most important thing in business is basically equity right, right. especially for an entrepreneur right? right if you are getting into uh, building a company and you know you have dreams of basically making it big you know don't assume that basically you're going to be making money you know by salary or things like that right because right. Uh, you know i sh- I'm, i'm telling you this out of experience right if you <laughs> want to make money uh, from salary there are 20000 other ways you know to do it don't do a startup right it's right. like it's the most difficult thing to do if you want to make money you know in the traditional format right right i think it's very very important to maximize opportunity that you know you will actually end up making money using equity right now when it comes to equity right now there are different formats of equity right one is obviously in the private market and one is in the public market right right now the thing with the private market right is ultimately what ends up happening is that that's illiquid fundamental right right and at some point in time you have to build a company which eventually you can ipo right right and what tends to happen is that the more and more money you raise the probability of success actually decreases right and this is something which people don't understand because whenever you raise capital right you're putting more and more people in front of you to get paid first in case of success right right that's basically the maths of it right right so basically when you do these things right ultimately what happens is eventually there is a lot of pressure on the company to grow fast mm-hmm. and grow incredibly big right? right and i don't personally feel very comfortable running a financial services company that way right because eventually a financial services company right is recognized by legacy and by stability and by trust right right so then when you're building in the public domain right and i don't have basically a lot of institutional investors basically sitting and you know basically dictating how i run the business right we are the majority <laughs> shareholder basically right. right we have i think 70 plus percent stake in the company and that's going to long continue right because fundamentally from our perspective we are building this company from 10 years on so right. the best combination of this essentially is that you know you run the company by being the majority shareholder that's one Interesting. number two in this way you kind of maximize basically for long term benefits of right. the company number 3 by being publicly listed you actually have liquid stock which means it's a great benefit to my investors because retail investors can participate in the startup sure. story they can see it in front of their eyes but most importantly if they don't like the story they can sell my stock right, right? similarly for you know other investors who come on board or for existing team members they have a clear way of making wealth right this is in some story which i'm selling as an example where you know you take esops right. today you know 10 years later they may be magic they may be magic beans which are worth you know 20 times 100 times the price right? <laughs> right all of it is in front of you right you're making wealth which you can actually you know see in front of your screen you can exercise those options whenever you kind of want to so a lot of those aspects right make a public company incredibly attractive but that is that is not to say that you know private companies aren't you know great uh, right. a running a public company requires a lot more uh, of a thicker skin <laughs> right because suddenly instead of having right. you know four to five investors you know we have like thousands of shareholders is an example sure. right and uh, being a company that we are today we attract a very young uh, shareholder base right and so right. they are very passionate uh, you know so we have to obviously we love that aspect about them right but you have to have that thick skin that you know whenever things aren't great they will let you know things aren't great right, right. and instead of hearing four voices you'll hear thousands of voices but at the right. same point in time when things are great you know you will we have literally emails coming in from people who you know purchased our stock like when it was like 15 rupees 20 rupees and today it's like 800 rupees or so right. you know it's it's made generational wealth for them right because for most of india if you know 5 lakh rupees gets into you know the territory of becoming 60 70 80 lakh rupees right. you know it's it's game changing for them right absolutely um, so those are stories which i really hold true how, to myself right how difficult is it to create a team right i mean uh, you know i mean and, and you know what i mean right i mean you know last week has been unreal right i mean uh, you're a tech company tech talent is is coming in super expensive right now when when you're a listed entity 
right? Uh, like you said, right? I mean, there is a certain responsibility. There is a certain agility with which you have to build. I mean, not necessarily thick skin. I will, uh, fact, you need to be that in any case, right? Uh, when you're building a business. But I think here you need to be very sensitive, right? Because, you know, your logic is out there in the open for people to question. Uh, how difficult is it to attract talent, right? Or, 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 or because the entity is listed, it's very clear and transparent to people that, you know, this is, uh, you know, you're, you're part of something which is going to get uh, built over a period of time. This is long term. Uh, this is not paper uh, in many in, in many ways, right? Uh, but love to understand, right? Uh, how's been that piece for you? So our DNA, right? By default, from a cultural perspective, we are incredibly transparent and you know straightforward, right? right. Like in every aspect, right? Whether it's come you know dealing with team members or it's dealing with investors or pretty much anybody, right? Uh, we don't like to beat around the bush and we basically just give them this, you know, give them this feel straight away, right? So honestly, from our perspective, like attracting talent has been, you know, being public is actually a huge benefit in doing that, right? right. Because what happens is eventually they can actually just look at my financials, uh, you know, and know what's the status of the company. They can mm -hmm. go to like, uh, you know, BSC as an example and see what the growth of the company has been in the last four years. Right. right. They can actually go to my blog, which, you know, you can write if you're a private company or a public company, but you have to kind of, you know, be more public as a public company, right. By right. default. So, <laughs> right. so they, they get a more, you know, intimate view of the company. Right. And great. ultimately what I've kind of realized, right. Is if you're incredibly talented, right. And we tend to hire young people, right. Like right. we don't, as an example, I don't think there's a me and Viksha were the oldest people in the company and we are like right. 33 and 34. Right. Interesting. Majority of my company is sub 28, 27 kind of age group, right? Wow. And this has been my philosophy when it came to Farm Easy, when it came to Kupon Dunya, when it came to even Hotstar, right? We hired incredibly young people right. who have, who, you know, whose experiences basically are incredibly rich and dense, right? They're not necessarily, you know, 10 years into something and, you know, then we get them on board because as a startup, what a lot of people forget is that you need to hire other individuals who are also quote unquote startups in their own career, right? right? You need to nurture them. You need to grow them. And the returns there are astounding, right? So to me, as an example, like this transparency that we are able to offer our team, you know, and being public out there, uh, you know, honestly, like a lot of people are not comfortable, you know, sharing all the details, but right. we are quite opposite, right? Because fundamentally, whatever it is, it's the truth. Right. right. Whether it's great numbers, whether it's right. horrible numbers, right. It, it, this is actually what's happening. And, you know, it would affect, if it, it would affect me if I'm managing quarters, right. If I'm right. managing for a year or managing for two years, this is a business we've held for 30 years. This is a business right. I'm hundred percent sure we're going to holding, we're going to be holding it for the next 30. Right? right. So to when you, when you start thinking in decades, I don't really care about, you know, what information is out there next quarter or even the next quarter after that. Because the only thing, you know, we pitch right to our team members and to basically any investor basically looking to, you know, get into the cap table is very simple, right? Ultimately, like we think of ourselves as, you know, somewhat of a, think about us as almost delivery in 2008 when Flipkart, Amazon and all were just starting out, right? right. Regardless of who won that race, basically, right, of, of becoming the e-commerce platform, delivery became the infrastructure company and they won regardless of who won over there. Right. In many ways, we are that for fintech, right? Interesting. The only bet that you need to make over here is in 2030, do you think, uh, you know, majority of the loans out there are going to be digital? If the right. answer to that is yes, we are 100% confident with the talent density that we have that, you know, we will be powering majority of them, right? With our technology infrastructure. And super. that's how we kind of think of ourselves. Super. Mikhail, towards the end of our conversation, it's been a super conversation, right? Uh, what are the next two years like? Uh, you know, you're somebody who has a plan, right? Uh, you know, you're looking at the changes. Uh, you're factoring in a lot of this transition that we kind of spoke of, right? What are the next two years like? Like, what is it that you're preparing Apollo Invest for? I'd love to understand that. I would have loved to ask you a five-year question. I know you'd like to think in decades, right? But we are in a very, very interesting time, right? I think markets are going to change in how product life cycles are going to be very different. Uh, you know, our backend infrastructure needs a lot of alignment, right? Uh, fads are going to fly faster. Uh, I am... Uh, you know, super excited about the, uh, you know, this, this, this craziness, which is going to come into market, right? Because it's going to open up many, many opportunities for many, many people, right? Uh, I think we're going to be an exciting market in many ways, right? Uh, but what are the next two years like? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, when, when I think about 
a pool of invest right in terms of its journey right it's got product market fit it's got founder market fit right. we're seeing tremendous scale and momentum right um now in order for us to continue in this journey mm-hmm. and dominate in our space right the thing that we have to do really really well is now bring in like basically build in an avengers level team in Sorry. short right so we have a team we have like actually a project going on in the company today it's mm-hmm. called you know the avengers initiative interesting right? uh, the way we think about ourselves right now right is essentially there was you know uh, there were marvel movies within the company right where <laughs> of iron man being separate and you know hulk being separate and all of these guys right. basically you know we have a few really really good superheroes but now what we need to do is take this to another level altogether because in order to take you know the company now the way i think about it right like is we went from 0 to 10 now we gone to 10 to 100 now we need to go right. from 100 to 1000 right right the the dna and the quality of the team basically needed over here and the skill set needed over here is different and we need to recognize that and mm-hmm. then get in the team accordingly which right. is able to now carry the torch and go it to the next level right in many ways you know companies are a function of you know how much can you know basically the founders take it right Right. and beyond a certain point in time you know having done this multiple right. times i realized founders can't scale right right <laughs> and in order for this to basically work you need to basically get in a plus team members into the company who take it to a different trajectory where even you can't even imagine yourself taking the company to and it's very important for you to recognize that right, right. and that's what now the focus is in the company all about right who is the set of people that we can basically get into the company who can take this beyond the imagination of the founders as well You know, Mikhail, that's a that's a very interesting point that you highlighted. Right? I was in a recent conversation, and I think, uh, and this was with a very senior founder, uh, right, of a large group who is now transitioning into being a new world uh, entity, right. Um, and the biggest of all problems that he highlighted is that you know, if you do not have that entrepreneurial DNA in the organization, which essentially, and and I think in his case, it meant him and say the family members. Uh, his perspective was that you, if you don't Uh, you know if you if you want to scale right from that you know like you said right from 100 to 1000 you have to have that dna entrepreneur uh, that entrepreneurial uh, dna in the in the organization right because you know the biggest of all challenges uh, according to him right and which i kind of in a way agree with right is that as soon as you have mediocrity in the organization where you have people who are coming in thinking 10 to 6 right have a clear that you know 2 3 years they're going to be in the organization bring in that service mindset bring in that employee mindset right uh really limits the possibilities they're not necessarily risk takers because you then get into a phase where you try and save your backside it just becomes very very complicated right uh, but i think what you are kind of you kind of alluding to is very different um i think possibly when you do this selection entrepreneurial attitude is going to be so much much more important right i'm sure you know you are a man with a plan right uh, you know who's worked this framework right uh, and and i think next time when we talk uh we'll possibly discuss this in a little more uh, detail in terms of how this is playing out but uh, you know we wish you all the very best uh, on this journey mikhil um, you know we think it's an it's an it's a very very interesting time you're you know as an organization in just that right spot uh, to be playing this game right and uh, scaling from that 100 to 1000 uh, as we you know uh, you know bring the session to an end uh, you know this is a more cliched side of it right but i love to do this where i ask founders any suggestions and uh, you know and and advice that they have for fellow founders right because i think you know every journey is unique uh, you know this is the fastest way to learn right uh, and i'm sure you'd agree what would that advice mikhil be if you were to or suggestion that you would want to give it out to the large fraternity i mean the most common advice uh, you know i kind of tell uh, you know at least budding founders that i kind of interact with right is small you know solve a very small niche problem first and do it in a way that basically customers absolutely love you right, right? before you attack something which is too wide and unfocused right because this is a problem which i see uh, haunt a lot of startups basically right, right? Uh, so that's you know that's the biggest thing i would kind of focus <laughs> on uh, you right. know if i was an early stage founder starting up all over again interesting poor founders i feel for i think what you're saying is absolutely spot on but the fact of the matter is i think when you're talking to investors this you know the conversation is always about the larger vision right what this possibly could be and i think that unfortunately um you know just complicates the entire thinking process for a founder right but i think i think what you're saying is absolutely spot on just focus on that 
one particular problem, I think it'll, and let that be the foundation of future growth, right? Uh, is, is essentially what I gather from what you're saying. Mikhail, it was a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much for taking the time out. You know, I loved every bit of this conversation. I have enjoyed my conversations every time with you. Uh, look forward to having you with us much sooner. We wish you all the very best from that, you know, the 100 to 1,000 journey. That's always an exciting one. Uh, that's always a complicated one. And that's always the consuming one, right? Uh, but in a market like India with, you know, these nuances that we have, it just becomes so much more interesting. We wish you all the very best. And, and, and you know, we, we wish to see you doing much better on the browser uh, and a lot of wealth creation for a lot of stakeholders. Thank you so much for it. It was a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much.